Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to a very special edition of uh, ARA's webinar on Wednesday. Uh, I'm Sri Rao, your moderator for today's webinar entitled Traffic Speed Deflectometer TSD Preliminary Lessons Learned from DSTO, a new program for flexible payment response under moving loads. Um, today's webinar Wednesday uh, and along with next month's webinar Wednesday are very notable. Um, as the cover slide indicates, uh, today's presentation is a tribute to our colleague and good friend, uh, Doug Steele, uh, who left us uh, way too early, uh, January last year of 2023. So today, uh, this year, this month will be his uh, one month anniversary of uh, uh, Doug Steele uh, leaving us. Uh, and uh, stay tuned until uh, next month's webinar Wednesday. Uh, stay tuned until the end of today's presentation, uh, and I will um, kind of uh, go over why next month's webinar Wednesday is also uh, very notable. So now I'd like to introduce our presenter and my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Hyung Suk Lee. Uh, Hyung Lee is a principal research engineer with the Air Force Operating Services, that is the AOS group of Applied Research Associates. Uh, he's a civil engineer with a PhD degree in pavement and materials engineering from Michigan State University. Uh, Chiang joined ARA in 2006 as a staff engineer and worked as a full-time consultant on site at the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, where he managed ARA's non-destructive testing activities for the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, in 2010, he joined FDOT as the state's non-destructive testing engineer. Uh, prior to joining ARA in 2015. So in 2015, he rejoined ARA. Um, Hyung has 18 years of experience in the field of payment evaluation, structural analysis, and forensic investigations using NDT uh, devices such as falling weight deflectometer, ground penetrating radar, uh, lock wheel friction testers, and various texture meters. Uh, in addition, Hyung has conducted various research studies on truck pavement interaction. Um, dynamic modeling of asphalt pavements, pavement surface characteristics, as well as viscoelastic asphalt material characterization. Um, so Hyung, uh, as many of you who attend the webinar Wednesday regularly, has had a lot of very interesting presentations on this topic, and I'm sure today's topic and today's pre presentation will be a treat for all of us uh, listening in on Hyung's presentation. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Dr. Hyung Lee. Hyung? Thank you, Shree, for a great introduction. And welcome everyone to the first ARA Webinar Wednesday presentation for the year 2024. Like Shree mentioned, uh, this presentation has a very special meaning uh, for myself personally. Uh, so I'd like to thank um, all of you uh, joining us uh, for this webinar today. Um, again, uh, the uh, we'll be talking about the traffic speed deflectometer, uh, shortly the TSD, and I'll be sharing some of the preliminary lessons learned from DSTL, which is a new program that is currently being developed uh, for uh, flexible payment response under moving loads. What you see on the screen is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction to talk about payment deflection testing and how the deflections are calculated from the TSD data. And I'll talk, uh, talk a little bit about DSTIL itself just to show you what it is and what, what it can do. And then I'll show you some of the theoretical um, example simulations uh, that I ran using DSTIL. And I'll uh, show you another slide on some of the additional challenges with the TSD data, and I'll wrap up the presentation with a short summary. So deflection testing is a, is a primary non-destructive testing methodology for uh, the structural evaluation of pavements. And as of today, uh, the current standards uh, on deflection testing are built around the falling weight deflectometer. Um, it is uh, probably the most frequently used equipment for um, deflection testing. Uh, almost all highway agencies in the U.S. and across the globe uh, use the falling weight deflectometer, shortly the FWD, 
uh, for uh, project level uh, and or network level deflection testing uh, for their highway network. But the FWD uh, has limitations. Uh, basically, the way that the testing is conducted is that the truck has to, comes to a complete stop and drops this huge weight onto the pavement surface and those uh, the resulting deflections are measured by a series of deflection sensors that are located away from uh, from the load plate. So it's a discrete testing. Um, so you have, and you have to have traffic control uh, for this testing. Uh, so there are limitations, and it is probably not the best equipment for uh, uh, a very large uh, roadway network. So in recent years, uh, several traffic, traffic speed deflection devices, the TSDDs, have been developed uh, to overcome the limitations of the FWD. Uh, so these devices were developed to be able to collect deflection data over a large network more efficiently. And almost all of these TSDD uh, equipment um, are basically a full-blown truck, uh, like the one you see here on the, in the picture. Um, and these trucks are uh, equipped with several uh, sensors and, and other things for measuring the deflection under this uh, trailer axle uh, while it's moving at highway speeds. And again, there, there are other TSDDs that have been introduced uh, to the community, but the contents of this webinar um, are specific to the traffic speed deflectometer, the TSD with Doppler lasers. And so let's talk a little bit about the TSD itself. Um, well, a lot of you may believe that the TSD measures uh, the deflections under the axle, but it actually does not. Uh, just because of the nature of the Doppler lasers uh, that the TSD is equipped with. The Doppler lasers do not measure displacements or deflections. The, the Doppler lasers measure the deflection velocity. And when this deflection velocity is divided by the vehicle's speed, it gives us what is called the deflection slope, as you see um, uh, on the figure on the left, if you can follow my uh, laser pointer. And there are several Doppler lasers uh, mounted on the TSD, a few of them in front of the axle and a few of them uh, behind the axle. So we have a set of deflection slopes which, has, which need to be integrated to give us the deflection that we want. And uh, it turns out there are some challenges with the integration process. Just to give you an idea of what the challenges are, I'll show you a couple examples. Um, let's say you start with a deflection um, and you're trying to calculate the slope. I mean, the deflection is nothing but the slope at a given location along this curve. So, the, so it, is, it is unique. And when you calculate the slope uh, for the entire curve, you always end up with a deflection slope that is unique. But on the other hand, if you start from uh, the deflection slope and try to get deflections, you can actually end up with an infinite number of deflections because of the integration constant C, uh, if you recall from your uh, calculus uh, uh, courses uh, in college. So just as an example, I'm showing you three different deflections on the right-hand side of this slide that have identical slopes. I mean, the slope of this uh, point here for the green curve uh, is the same as the slope of the uh, black curve at the same location here. So how do we know which deflection is correct? And integration mathematically means calculating the area under a given curve. So in our case, the deflection is nothing more than the area under the deflection uh, slope curve. Now the challenge is that we only have a limited number of sensors, and we do not really know what happens beyond the sensor location. And that is actually a big challenge because ideally, 
you would want to know where the deflection is equal to zero. And that's where you want to start integrating uh, to calculate the area and work your way from right to left say, on this graph to get your peak deflections uh, below the axle. But how do we know where the deflection is zero? Uh, so there are some assumptions behind the way the deflection slopes are currently being integrated. And one of the biggest assumption is that the deflection slope at uh, 3.5 meters or 11 and a half feet ahead of the TSD axle is equal to zero. And this is almost an enforced assumption in the sense that the TSD has what is called a reference uh, Doppler uh, laser sensor at 3.5 meter ahead of the uh, axle and it measures deflection slope. But that deflection slope is subtracted from all other slope measurements, and it is not, and that measurement is not reported to the end user. And I also have to uh, mention that the 3.5 meter is for some of the old TSDs, and I was informed that some of the newer TSDs uh, have the reference are at 3.0 or 3.0 meters um, ahead of the axle. So just something to keep in mind uh, when you're dealing with the TSD uh, data. And then the other assumption behind integration is that the not only the deflection slope at 3.5 meter is zero, but also the deflection itself is zero at 3.5 meters ahead of the uh, TSD axle. And I'll show you some examples using two of the most frequently used integration methods uh, that we have uh, today. Uh, the first being the Peterson method, which is used by uh, Greenwood Engineering uh, in Europe. And then the other method uh, being area under the curve or the AUTC method uh, that is used by ARB um, here in the US. So just to give you an idea of what uh, Peterson method is, um, it's basically a summation of two um, statistical distribution functions. Um, and to be more specific, it is a summation of the stable distribution function and the normal distribution function. So uh, the in Peterson method, basically the derivative of these two functions are are fitted to the measured uh, slope. And you can, on, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see just, uh, just a quick example of what the stable function and the derivative of the stable function and the normal distribution function um, look like. And once the fitting is done, you have all these parameters that go into these functions, and you plug these parameters into the integrated version of the equation, and you get your deflections. And again, and also I have to mention the disclaimer that uh, this uh, methodology that was uh, used in this presentation that was implemented by myself uh, and, and the results uh, that I will be showing you in this presentation may not be uh, the results that you may get from the Greenwood's integration methods. There might be subtle differences in, in how the uh, in, uh, integration was implemented. So just a disclaimer. And for the area under the curve method, uh, the, this method uses uh, the cubic Hermite spline uh, that is fitted through the measure, measured data points. And uh, it's a spline uh, interpolation. So it exactly goes through the measured data points, whereas the Peterson method, uh, which used the normal and the stable distribution functions may or may not go through the measured data points exactly, but this one um, does. And once this fitting is done, um, it starts at, uh, at the reference sensor locations and calculates the area under, the, um, under this curve to get the uh, deflections. And again, the same disclaimer uh, uh, that uh, this method was implemented by myself for the presentation, so it may not give you the the exact or the identical deflections to uh, what ARB is using. So D-Steel 
is a new 3D spectral element or finite element, a finite layer a solution that is currently being developed. And uh, um, I'm not going, I'm not going to go into any any uh, details. But if you are familiar with the 3D Move program that was developed at the University of Nevada Reno um, years and years ago, uh, D Steel is almost equivalent uh, to 3D Move. And uh, it is capable of simulating elastic, viscoelastic layers within the pavement structure. And uh, just for verification purposes, and just to show you how these steel results compared to some other available programs, here's just a quick comparison of the D steel and 3D move deflections under a single tire. And this one was for an elastic pavement. You can see that uh, there are there is a good agreement between the two programs. And then on the in the middle, um, here's a quick comparison between the D-steel deflection and the uh, viscowave deflection under a uh, viscoelastic uh, pavement. Um, and again, you can see uh, that uh, there's a good agreement between the two programs. And although D-steel D is still under development, I just wanted to show you what the interface looks like. Uh, the calculation engine uh, behind D-Steel was implemented in C++, uh, but the interface is currently being built in Microsoft Excel environment. So you can see um, here as I change the input, the base or the subgrade modulus, you can see the uh, results being um, updated uh, almost instantaneously. Uh, but the more important thing to mention here is that um, the deflection as well as the deflection slope is a direct output uh, from D steel uh, because the long term goal uh, with D steel, um, if you ask me, is to be able to use D steel to analyze the deflection slopes directly uh, rather than uh, using the deflections. With that, I'll show you some of the theoretical examples uh, that I um, uh, that I developed using D-Steel. And I'll be showing you three different examples. And the first example is for a conventional uh, flexible pavement with uh, eight inches of asphalt um, on top. There's nothing special about this pavement. It's uh, just a typical flexible pavement uh, sitting on um, sitting on uh, 12 inches of base uh, over subgrade. And the second example is also a flexible pavement, but this entire pavement is sitting on a very weak subgrade and a very deep bedrock. Okay. And the third example, uh, for now, I'll just call it a mysterious pavement, and I'll show you what that pavement is uh, when we get to that example. And as for the loading, um, uh, we ended up mod modeling the, uh, the entire um, TSD. So this is the <clears throat> configuration that I obtained from uh, one of the uh, previous uh, research studies on TSD. Uh, so you can see that we have the steering axle here, the tandem driving axle here, and that is the uh, TSD axle. And the uh, deflections and the deflection slopes were obtained along the center of the of these dual tires um, of the of the TSD axle. So let's look at the first example. So again, this first example corresponds to a conventional flexible pavement, uh, nothing special, and here on the right hand side, I'm showing you the D steel uh, simulated deflection. And uh, these red dots are there just to show you where the TSD sensors um, are located uh, relative to the axle um, location. And at the bottom, uh, I'm showing you the uh, deflection slope corresponding to uh, the deflection that is shown above. And with that said, let's 
uh, visit our um, assumptions uh, that we discussed uh, regarding the integration. Is the deflection at 3.5 meter uh, ahead of the axle equal to zero? And the answer is no. Uh, there was about half a mil, half a mil deflection here. Um, and then the second assumption is the deflection slope equal to zero at 3.5 meter. And it was small, but but not, it wasn't exactly zero. There was about 0.02 mils per foot of deflection slope. So knowing that these, uh, def the, knowing that the deflection and the deflection slope are not equal to zero uh, at the assumed locations, let's see how the, the integrated deflections are um, affected. So again, this is a theoretical example. So these red dots um, are the uh, deflection slope that I uh, obtained from D steel and the same slope shown down here. And I used both the Peterson method and the AUTC method uh, to carry out the integration. So here on the top, you see the uh, Peterson curve that is fitted through uh, the D steel uh, deflection slopes. And then accordingly, the integration is carried out to uh, calculate the deflections. And at the bottom, <clears throat> the cubic hermite spline was fitted through the D steel uh, deflection slope. And the integration was carried out accordingly to give us the AUTC integrated deflection. So let's see how these deflections compare to the true deflections that we had from D steel. And this is how the three deflections compare. The uh, black solid curve shows you the deflection from D steel. So this is the true deflection. And the red dots are there um, just to show you where the TSDD sensors were located. And the blue dashed curve shows you the deflection from Peterson method. And the red long dash uh, corresponds to the AUTC deflection. And you can see immediately that uh, these two integrated deflections are over predicting uh, the deflection by by a mil or or a mil and a half across the board. And that's that's pretty good. I mean, you may think it's pretty good, but what one thing we have to uh, remember is that for pavement design, a lot of the times the subgrade modulus is the important parameter that we want to calculate from the deflection data. And the subgrade modulus is often calculated from the deflections measured away from the load, say, for example, 48 inches or 60 inches, uh, depending on the agency. But one and a half mil difference at, at, uh, uh, at this location could mean up to 43% or 87% error and compared to the true um, deflection. So just something to keep in mind um, when you're trying to use the TSD data for uh, back calculating or estimating the subgrade modulus. And then the other thing is if you look at the overall shape of these integrated deflections, they're pretty good. They're very close to what the, the D steel had predicted. So the some of the shape parameters, uh, for example, the surface curvature index, the NCI, which is D0, D0 minus D12. So the deflection uh, uh, directly below the axle minus deflection 12 inches away from the axle. Uh, th those depend on the shape of the deflection bowl here. So, and because these shapes look pretty good, the errors within uh, these deflection shape parameters were um, actually much lower than the deflection themselves. And this is just another uh, deflection uh, shape parameter, the base damage index, that is D12 minus D24. And again, um, uh, the, the errors were relatively lower uh, compared to the actual deflection themselves. So that was the first example. Let's move on to the second example. So again, for uh, the second example, I put the flexible pavement on top of a 
very weak subgrade and a very deep bedrock. Um, so here again, here's the deflection uh, under the entire uh, TSD truck. Um, and here is the deflection slope uh, predicted from the steel for the TSD truck. And again, these red dots are there just to show you where the TSD sensors are located. And with that, let's revisit the assumptions. Is the deflection zero at 3.5 meters uh, from the axle? And the answer is no. Um, we're actually seeing about uh, five and a half mils of deflection um, at that location. So it's, uh, uh, it's pretty significant. It's nowhere close to zero. And if you look at this entire deflection curve from the steel, uh, the deflection is actually never zero uh, under the entire uh, TSD truck. And that's because it, the subgrade was so soft and thick, so um, it's actually acting like a sponge. And that sponge is, uh, is deforming um, under the entire uh, truck load. So just another thing to keep in mind. And the second assumption is the deflection slope zero at 3.5 meters and if you just look at this graph it may seem like it is close but it actually is not uh, the deflection slope at this location was about 0.25 mils per foot and again the deflection slope is <clears throat> not very frequently used um, or analyzed in, in our field so you may not be very familiar with this and may not have a good feel of uh, 0.25 being big or small or how significant it is. And the same thing applies to me. I'm not uh, very familiar with the deflection slope um, yet, but one thing I can tell you is this 0.25 mils per foot of deflection slope is more than 10 times the slope that we saw uh, uh, that we saw in the, uh, from the first example. So. Uh, in that sense, this is pretty, uh, pretty significant. So let's go through the same exercise and see how the integrated deflections compare to the true um, deflections. So again, here the red dots are the deflection slopes that I calculated using D steel. And this black solid curve here shows you the Peterson curve uh, that was fitted uh, through these data points. And of course, the integration was carried out accordingly to give us uh, the deflection. And same thing for the AUTC method. Uh, the uh, cubic hermite spline was fitted through the D-steel uh, uh, deflection slope, and the integration was uh, conducted accordingly to give us the deflections. So let's see how these two deflections compare to the actual um, D-steel deflection. Again, um, in this graph, the black solid curve is the D-steel deflection that we saw earlier. And the two integrated deflections are shown up here. And you can immediately see that the integrated deflections are underestimating the deflection bowl by about 8 mils um, across the board. Um, and um, so if you were to take uh, these deflection magnitudes and try to back calculate the uh, structural layer modulus, um, you have to be very, very careful in the result uh, that you may get back um, because obviously uh, subgrade modulus will not be uh, uh, the modulus that you would expect from this true deflection here. But the shapes are still looking pretty good. Uh, so the SCI parameter and the BDI parameter, these shape in the indices uh, look pretty good and their errors were actually much lower uh, than the deflection themselves. And with that, let's move on to the third example. And before I tell you what, <coughs> pavement, um, this third example response to, I just wanted to show you the D-steel uh, deflection slopes uh, for all three uh, examples. 
uh, that I have at this uh, presentation. So again, this this is the DSTO predicted uh, deflection slope uh, for the first example, and in the middle, uh, deflection slopes for the second example. And for these two deflection slopes, you can almost see a smooth curve going through these data points at the sensor locations. But for the third example, uh, it's actually not that smooth. Uh, it starts smooth here, uh, but then there's a little kink uh, near the axle location. So it bounces back up a little bit. And the same thing actually happens behind the axle as well. So would you, if you are familiar with, say, the FWD data and uh, familiar with the non-decreasing deflections that we uh, see from the FWD data every now and then, you may say, uh, is this something similar to that uh, or some other error um, in the measurement? But the answer is that this was not uh, any type of measurement error. The deflection slope that you saw in the previous slide for the third example, which is shown here again, uh, these uh, this deflection slope was also predicted from these steel. So this is again uh, one hundred percent um, simulation. There is no measurement error. So what caused uh, the uh, uh, the deflection slope uh, to bounce back up here? What pavement was this? The answer um, is that uh, this deflection slope came from a uh, composite pavement. So I uh, basically took the pavement that we had from the first example, I removed the granular base uh, that we had below the AC, and I replaced it with, uh, uh, say, a, a concrete layer having a modulus of 4 million PSI. And uh, the co that concrete layer is much stiffer uh, than the asphalt concrete. So as um, so as you approach uh, the axle, uh, the deflection slope actually reduces a little bit because of the thick and st stiff PCC layer uh, that is resisting bending. Uh, but then as you move closer to the axle, the deflection slope is picked back up uh, by the asphalt layer that is sitting on top of the concrete layer. So. These are the things that we need to start thinking about when it comes to TSD data, and we need to uh, work together to better understand what the TSD data can uh, can give us. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you are uh, familiar with the FWD data, uh, we may have to put some new glasses on uh, when you're looking at the uh, looking at the TSD data because obviously. Uh, the deflection slope is not equal to the deflection. And more importantly, the TSD is not the same thing as the falling rate deflectometer. And so I went through the same exercise of integrating the D steel uh, deflection slope using the Peterson method and the AUTC method. So here on top, you see the these red dots that were uh, uh, that are the deflection slopes predicted from D steel, and I actually uh, struggled uh, with the Peterson method because again the Peterson method had to fit the sum summation of the nor uh, normal distribution and the stable distribution function, and depending on the C parameters that I had for those functions, it uh, it, it was giving me different result uh, almost every time. So I went through several several iterations, um, and I uh, uh, basically landed at this uh, uh, black solid curve uh, that was fitted through uh, the measured point. But just for comparison purposes, I'm showing you how these uh, different seed values, how these different curves obtained using different seed values may affect your deflections. But uh, for the next slide, uh, we'll proceed with the black solid curve, which is what I picked uh, for my final, um, final fit. And the AUTC method um, does not have that problem because it always goes 
through uh, the measured uh, deflection slopes. So I was able to fit uh, the deflection slope curve through the cubic splines without uh, any difficulties. And the integration, uh, of course, was conducted accordingly. So this is how the two integrated deflections compare uh, to the true uh, D-steel deflection. Again, the black solid curve is the D-steel deflection. And the uh, red uh, dash, uh, dashed curve shows you the deflection uh, integrated using the AUTC method. And you can see it's doing pretty good. Uh, but, uh, but as you move away from the axle, again, you are seeing quite some errors um, at the end of deflections. On the other hand, uh, the Peterson method uh, really, really struggled. Um, and the, pro the, the pro primary issue, not an issue, um, primary reason behind that, that might be that the stable uh, distribution function and the normal distribution function that is used that are used in Peterson method, those functions are not designed to fit uh, uh, the deflection slope that had uh, had the kink that you saw in the previous slide. And uh, Peterson himself mentioned that several times in his dissertation. So uh, those are some of the things we need to be uh, looking out for. Uh, but the more important thing I'd like to point out is imagine uh, that this black solid curve, the true deflection from D steel, is not shown on this graph and you are left with this blue uh, Peterson deflection and the red um, AUTC deflection. Those two deflections are from the same measurement, but two completely different deflections. Which one are you going to use? And how do you know which one is correct? And how are you going to make that decision? You know, these are some of the challenges that, uh, uh, that the TSD community would have to come together start working on, um, in, in my opinion. So I'll be showing you some additional challenges with the integration. Um, and for this particular slide, these deflection slopes are not from D-Steel. Uh, I, I actually uh, went through some of the TSD data that, uh, that were uh, provided to me and intentionally uh, picked a bad example from uh, from the data set that I that I had, and the problem with this measured data set is that the two sensor readings in front of the axle, the two closest uh, Doppler lasers um, in front of the axle, they they gave us a negative deflection slope. Um, so uh, how is this? going to affect uh, the, the integration, um, basically, was the question. So again, I went through um, integrating using the Peterson method as well as the cubic uh, hermite spline or the AUTC method. And of course, the issue, I had the same issue with the Peterson uh, method. I tried different initial values for the stable and the normal distribution functions. But I really couldn't come up with a with what I would call the best fit um, for for the um, uh, deflection slope. So I'll show I'm showing you uh, just uh, just three of the uh, fits that I that I made and the corresponding um, integrated deflections um, on the right hand side. And again, the the issue here is well, not only that these functions were not fitting. The measured data points very well, uh, but also that the, that the deflection actually is on the initial uh, C values that I punched in to to these functions. And again, AUTC method uh, does not go through iteration to fit the curve, so it doesn't. We don't have a problem with the initial condition, but uh, because the um, AUTC method, the cubic hermite uh, spline, goes through the measured data um, exactly uh, because it's an interpolation. Uh, if you have a negative uh, slope in front of the axle, you're going to end up with a non-decreasing deflection um, near the uh, 
near the axle. So these are some of the errors that we need to be um, looking out for uh, when we are dealing with the TSD data. So just to summarize, um, again, the traffic speed deflectometer or the TSD uh, measures the deflection velocity or the deflection slope, and it is not measuring the deflections directly. And so the TSD deflections, uh, um, uh, they are uh, not measured, but they are integrated um, deflections. And because they are integrated, uh, they are an analysis parameter. They should not be called um, a measurement. Uh, the primary reason is because the deflections, these deflections are not unique. And the, the integrated deflections depend on the method of integration as well as the assumptions behind uh, those integrations. And for the integration method that require iteration, for example, the Peterson method, the the deflection will also depend on, on the initial guess or the seed values uh, that you punched in for those uh, functions. So in a sense, uh, if you're using the Peterson method, getting the deflection in itself is some sort of back calculation. So um, again, um, maybe we need to start uh, looking at the deflection slopes directly uh, rather than trying to integrate the deflection slopes and um, um, looking at them. I'm not, you don't have to agree with me, but um, it's just uh, one of the opinions that I have. Uh, but the integrated deflections, if you want to continue to use them, uh, you may want to uh, be aware that you may end up with some significant errors um, for the sensors that are uh, further away from the TSD axle. So uh, the subgrade modulus estimated or calculated from the uh, TSD deflection uh, may remain a challenge. But uh, if the deflection slopes are clean, if that signal is clean, uh, integrating the deflections may give you some reasonable deflection shapes. So the, uh, the, so the shape parameters like the SEI and the BDI that we talked about <clears throat> may give you uh, uh, actually lower errors than the deflection themselves. So with that, I'd like to thank you, thank all of you once again for joining us today. And uh, as Sri mentioned, uh, D Steel was named after Doug Steele, um, who who um, who was with ARA uh, for a long time. Uh, he actually was the guy who was running uh, ARA's research on the TSDD. Uh, with our uh, rolling wheel deflectometer when we had him had it. And um, I've only known Doug Steele for, for 18 years, and I'm sure there's other ARA folks that have known him for much, much longer than that. Uh, but on behalf of everyone that knew Doug Steele, uh, I, I, I can say that we still love him, we miss him, and will not, will never forget him and on on another personal note um, Doug Steele was not only one of the best friends I've made in life but he was one of the greatest human beings that I have ever met in my entire life so it's an it's an honor that I named this program after him all those who are on the webinar you may begin submitting your questions in the Q&A pod and Hyung will answer as many questions as possible in the time remaining. Uh, Hyung, there's a lot of questions. I'll get to that um, shortly. We hope all of you enjoyed today's presentation. I know I did, and I learned a lot, um, and that you will join ARA for future webinars. As I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, um, this month and next month are very special webinar Wednesdays. Um, as Hyung mentioned, today was uh, the webinar Wednesday dedicated to Doug Steele, our colleague. Uh, and next month on February 15th, uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, let's show some love to uh, Jerry DiMaggio. And as we celebrate five years of Webinar Wednesday, Jerry was is the driving force behind 
a webinar Wednesday and is the usual host for webinar Wednesday, as many of you know, who have attended our webinars for the past five years. So uh, it's going to be a very special uh, celebration of webinar Wednesday and Jerry will share um, what he has learned in 51 years of uh, practicing. Uh, and and it will be a really exciting and interesting uh, presentation. So please join us on Valentine's Day for that presentation. So let's get to the Q and A portion of the webinar. So uh, here I'm, I'm going to um, kind of ad lib some of these. Uh, the first question is uh, related to slide ten. Uh, Rami asks, "Is the horizontal speed described in slide ten assumed to be equal to the vehicle speed?" I believe so. Yep, it is. But uh, you have to keep in mind that the TSD uh, collects a lot of data, and when the data is reported, it is the average uh, of the. Uh, it is the average within a certain interval, whether it's one meter, three hundred meter, three hundred foot. Uh, so it's the average of the deflection velocity uh, for that segment and the average of the vehicle speed of that corresponding segment. So, so yes. So on slide 28, um, William asks, why does the deflection increase in magnitude again beyond the rise in front of the front axle around 800 inches on the horizontal axis? And, and there's a very um, related question um, by Sing Wei who asks, Please explain why deflections have multiple peaks. Oh, okay. I'll answer the second question first. Uh, the multiple peaks correspond to the different axles within the TSD. So this is the deflection under the steering axle, and then here's the deflection under the tandem driving axle. Then this is the deflection under the uh, TXD axle that is uh, uh, equipped with the lasers. And to go back to the first question, why is this deflection going up again? It is because of how it's modeled, because it's using the Fourier transform in the X and Y directions. So it actually assumes that this deflection repeats uh, over and over again in the two dimensional uh, X, Y domain. Uh, and uh, I could have eliminated that effect if I used a more uh, bigger, uh domain in the x and y uh and i and i tried uh, and uh, this would go away but it did not have a significant effect on the peak deflection that i was interested in so i was going to use a smaller domain for the x y uh, just to uh just to save some time just to save some runtime for for this deal all right, thank you, Young. Um, there's another question. There's two different participants who asked um, pretty much an identical question. Uh, Wei and um, Jing Wei asked, why consider D steel deflection as the true deflection? So, why is that your reference? Can you expand on why D steel curve is being regarded as the true deflection? Uh, because we have to start somewhere. Uh, we have to start with. Uh... Before we can uh, have a better understanding of the field data that may be affected by, uh, say, noise and other errors within the system, uh, we're going. I'm just going through a, a theoretical exercise to better understand the uh, uh, the deflection and the deflection slope and the pavement parameters. And it doesn't have to be these steel. We can use other um, uh, programs or algorithms that can simulate uh, the pavement deflection. Um, for example, another excellent program would, that can give you um, almost identical result to the D steel deflection would be uh, 3D move, um, or you can even use other uh, layered elastic solutions and get the deflections um, accordingly. But then uh, the, the, the other uh, effort that you're going to have to put in is some of those other programs are not outputting the deflection slopes directly. So you'd have to get the deflections from those programs and go through numerically 
differentiating the deflections to get the slope you need. All right, thank you, Young. So if I'm paraphrasing or understanding you right, Young, is you, you're saying that you're really testing these models and seeing how well they capture these deflections that um, that are modeled to any program that um, like DSTL or 3D move or what have you, but you're you're really trying to capture how these models perform uh, in in in, uh, in in its evaluation of these situations. Yes, basically how the integrate integration methodologies perform under these different conditions. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jacob asks, what kind of metrics do you think we can pull from the TSD and DSTL for network level payment management? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, again, like I said, the TSD, or or rather the uh, deflection slopes are relative, relatively new um, to the entire community, including myself. Um, so using, driving the indices uh, directly from uh, the deflection slopes, I mean, there, I'm sure there, uh, there, uh, there's many different things that we can pull. Uh, but what are they? I don't really have an answer, great answer to that as of now. But Hadi asks, uh, can these still be used for TSD modules back calculation? Um, how about FWD? Can it be used for FWD back calculation? Uh, for the FWD back, uh, for the back calculation of the FWD, yes, these still could possibly be used. Um, it's a matter of just modeling a circular uh, plate loading instead of a full blown. Uh, truck. Um, and the whole purpose of developing these deal was to be able to back calculate uh, the payment layer modules from the deflection slopes directly under the TSD truck, uh, if we know the loading and the uh, truck dimensions. Uh, but uh, uh, to be honest with you, have I gone through that exercise? No, not yet. So there's hopefully more to come. Uh, hopefully another future ARA webinar Wednesday when I get to that point. So um, Marshall Thompson says cohesive soils and granular materials are stress dependent moduli. Um, he assumed this is considered or not considered in DSTL. Can you um, touch upon that? Uh, those things are not considered uh, in DSTL as of right now. Uh, so we can only model uh, viscoelastic layers like the asphalt concrete that depends on time and temperature. And for the unbound layers, it's uh, modeling those as a linearly elastic material. So, so there's questions about availability of these steel. Can we, um, some people are asking whether they can get their hands on it. And also another related question is 3D move readily available? So can you answer those questions? 3D, 3D Move is readily available. Um, you can download it from, uh, I believe, uh, the UNR website. Uh, if you go to Google um, and just search for 3D Move, um, you can download it, install it, and run it um, uh, fairly easily. Uh, D-Steel, uh, the long-term plan for D-Steel is to release it as an open source um, code. Uh, just like I did for uh, the other program I developed, Fiscal Wave. Um, but uh, yeah, it will take some time. But uh, hopefully, it'll be it'll be released for uh, the entire TSD community. Yeah, I believe Three D Move was developed for the Federal Highway Administration, so it should be available for download on FHWA's website. Um, if I recall correctly, um, I think we're running out of time, so. Um, there's still several questions, so if you haven't gotten to your questions, uh, um, uh, we'll send, uh, please send an email to Hyung, and Hyung will address those uh, uh, in the short, uh, uh, if within a day or so. So we, if, if you have any questions and we didn't get to it, uh, please send an email to hlee at ara.com. Uh, that's younglee at ara.com, and uh, Hyung will try to answer your questions uh, for the next 24 hours. Uh, we just ask that you please make sure your questions are not consulting type questions um, and please understand that there may be some proprietary sensitivities around the topic that may limit uh, Young's ability to respond to your questions. 
Um, so on behalf of ARA, thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is recorded and the link will be made available on ARA's webinar Wednesday website uh, sometime next week. Uh, we will also send a PDA certificate to all participants verified by our attendance report as present for the full hour of the webinar. And a copy of today's presentation was all, will also be included in that uh, email. So please allow a few weeks, at least three weeks, to receive your certificate. ARA is a great company to work for, and it's very unique in that it's 100% employee owned. Uh, we continue to grow dynamically and are always looking for great people to join our team. If you are interested in employment opportunities within ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, please send a resume uh, and contact information to www.joinara at ara.com. That's uh, webinar Wednesday, join ARA at ara.com. Um, thank you for joining today, and we hope you will join us on February 14 for our, our next five-year anniversary of Webinar Wednesday, where Jerry DiMaggio will present sharing what I learned in 51 years of practice. So thank you for joining. Have a great afternoon and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.